Let's go ahead and open our Bibles up to the end of Matthew chapter 6. We have just a few notes to uh, finish out our current handout, and uh, then we'll be giving you another one this evening, and we'll get on to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 6, we are in a particular section of this scripture that has to do with worry. Depending on your Bible translation, you may have the word worry, or it might be uh, about taking thought for something, or caring about something. Um, Whatever your word is, you'll find it. In Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34, you'll find that word six times. It may not always be translated the same. For example, in verse 34, in the New American Standard Update, I have, so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. The word worry and care are from the same Greek word. That's the same term. And you'll find that term six times in this section of Scripture. Uh, The word is about its drawing power. It draws the mind, it draws the emotion, it draws the attention a certain direction. It takes you from this focus to that focus. And the idea here, the key verse that we have is verse 33. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So the drawing power of this worry is something that takes you away from the priority of God's kingdom, God's church, God's book, God's mission. takes you away from that priority, and it puts your attention on something else. I have to be paying attention to this, and I don't have time for that. And so that's the problem with the worry that's in this passage. I think Kevin pointed out uh, last week, uh, somewhere toward the end of class, is this just about a person who thinks about things and wants to take care of things? No, it's not really about that. Only if we are so concerned, and this all comes from verse 24. You can't serve God in mammon. You can't serve, serve God in wealth. God and material things. They draw you different directions. And then comes this big long text about this kind of worry. It has to do with choosing the wrong master in life, the wrong priority. And uh, some people get so busy with some things, they don't have time for God, they don't have time for Bible study, they don't have time for assembly, they don't, they don't have time for anything that God wants them to do because they're so busy accumulating things, material things paying attention to temporal things. And uh, I I ran into that on one occasion that just really floored me. Somebody, they knew they were dying. And a family member had called from another state to send me to them. They were not Christians. And this person, they knew they were dying. It was going to be, uh, you know, maybe a couple of months down the road, but They knew they were dying. And I knocked on their door and they were so busy with their bucket list. They didn't have time to talk to me. And the person died. And they died unprepared to meet God. It just floored me for somebody to know. And then they wanted, you know, a preacher to do their funeral. It was the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. We can get so busy with things in the world, so occupied with it, so distraught over doing this, doing that, having this, having the other thing, that we don't have time for the priorities of God. And so we need to make a choice about what kind of master we're going to serve. Verse 24. And this is the finishing of that thought as we get toward the end of chapter 6. That word worry or taking thought for or caring about this or that is translated a little differently, at least in my Bible translation, in 1 Corinthians 7. If you go with me over there, I want to take a quick look at that because there is a context there that we need to be thinking about. There's something going on there. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And I'm thinking about verse 26 first. I think then that 
this is good in view of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. The question is about whether somebody should get married. Um, somebody's spouse dies. Somebody's never been married before. And there's a question there about getting married. And Paul's answer is prefaced in verse 26. I think it's good in view of the present distress, persecution that's going on, how difficult it is to be a Christian, all the things that are going on in their world, in their culture, that make it hard to be a Christian. You're hiding from this one and hiding from that one, and uh, there's persecution come from, from the Jewish element, from the Roman element, they're pagans. Because of the present distress, if you're not married, don't get married. That's the message of verse 26, but for that reason, because of that problem. Now, when you get down to verse 32 through 34, but I want you to be free from concern. That word concern is our word. That's the word for worry. I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But the one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. Isn't that true? You get married and a husband wants to please his wife. She would like this. She would like that. She needs this, she needs that. And he wants to please her. He wants to give to her. He wants to earn for her. He wants to provide for her. And so he's concerned about that sort of thing. And his interests are divided. Now, the word interest there is in italics. It's not really there, but the word divided is the key idea. He's divided. He's not wholly committed to God. He's not completely concerned about God. He's divided because he's married and he has these other concerns about things of the world and material things to please his wife. And in the case of the present distress, it really makes things difficult because he's concerned about his wife. And now in the midst of all this persecution and all this trouble going on, on top of just the idea of wanting to please his wife with material things, there's this other big concern. And so he's very divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But the one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. So there's the shoe on the other foot. It's true for the man, it's true for the woman. When you get married, you're concerned about other things, material things, things of the world, and then you have this present distress going on, and so we can be divided. In Matthew chapter 6, they were divided because they chose the wrong master. And it drew them away from the things of the Lord. It's sort of like uh, those who wanted to follow Jesus and become his disciple. And Jesus said, you know, if you put your hand to the plow, you don't look back. You don't start and stop. You don't get drawn away with this over here when you said you're going to do this for me. It's got to be one or the other. So this anxiety, this care, it can be a word that's used in a positive sense. In Philippians 2 and verse 20, Paul wrote to that congregation, I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genu genuinely be concerned for your welfare. That's our word, concerned. This is about Paul sending Timothy to that congregation. And he said, he genuinely is concerned. You could use the word worry there. But it's the idea that Timothy is distracted from other things to be focused on them and their welfare. Their welfare in the Lord. That's a positive use of that word. You can be concerned. You can take thought for some really good things. He is drawn toward the kingdom of God, toward caring for those brethren from other things. So there's a positive use. It's also used that way in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 28. Paul was talking about all of the persecutions and troubles that he was facing. 
And he closes that list with this. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure of me, on me, of concern for all the churches. <coughs> Paul is drawn away from lesser things to be concerned for all the congregations he's had to do with. How are they doing? How are the brethren? Did they get through this problem? Have they overcome that? Are they growing in the Lord? Are they still faithful? He has concern for all the congregations of the Lord that he's had something to do with. And so he talks about it in a positive way in that text. But in Matthew 6, 25 through 34, it's very different. It's about, and things we've covered in Matthew 6, it's about having the wrong treasure. It's about having the wrong vision the wrong kind of eye, an eye that is full of darkness and division. It's the wrong kind of master. And it's connected in Matthew 6 and verse 30 with this, the end of that verse, you of little faith. <clears throat> so this is something that shrinks faith rather than helping it to grow. It can have a paralyzing influence on the more important things of God. Remember uh, Mary and Martha? Where was Mary? Where was she? He comes to their house. They're going to host him. There's going to be a meal. Where's Mary? She's at the feet of Jesus. And she's listening to him speak. He's teaching. That is, I mean, that's like a talking Bible. And here's Jesus revealing these mysteries and truths about himself and about the coming kingdom and about his Father in heaven. And there's Mary at his feet listening. <coughs> there wouldn't be another opportunity like that. There just wouldn't be. And she gave full attention to Jesus sitting at his feet. Where's Martha? She's in the kitchen. Is that a bad thing? It's not a bad thing. It's a bad thing in the way that Martha did it because she was upset at her sister Mary for not being in the kitchen with her and helping. And she complained to Jesus, tell her to get in here and help me. And <clears throat> Jesus said, Martha, Martha. I, I, hope, I hope he never calls my name twice. Martha, Martha. You are worried. That's our word. You are worthy, worried and bothered. You are worried and bothered about so many things. But only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Martha, if you want to be in the kitchen, I guess that's up to you. Maybe she could overhear. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I know we, I think, I think we still do. We've had remodeling, so I don't know for sure after the remodeling if it's still there. But I think we have speakers in our kitchen. We used to. And, and sometimes there's ladies in that kitchen and there's speaking going on in here. I'd rather have them in here. But, they can overhear some things. If you're in the nursery, there's speakers in there, and you can overhear some things. If you have to step out into the foyer area because you're coughing or you're caring for a baby, we have speakers out there. I don't know if, if Martha could overhear or not. I don't know how big the house was. I don't know where the kitchen was. But she wanted Mary to get away from Jesus, away from the feet of Jesus, and come in there and help her and clang pans or whatever she was doing. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered about so many things. Mary's doing a good thing here. And, and let her have this moment. And so uh, there's the word worried in a negative context again. There's a couple of illustrations in our text. Verses 26, 27. Uh, look at the birds of the air. 
They do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? That, that's an illustration. Birds go about their business doing what God designed birds to do. In the process of the birds doing what God designed them to do, He makes sure they have food. They just do. It's part of the process of fulfilling their design. God designed us to be His children of faith to be about his business, doing good works, preaching the gospel, sowing the seed of the kingdom. Those are things God wants us to do. And if we busy ourselves with things of the kingdom, then things like food and clothing are going to take care of themselves. It's part of the design. It's not our main focus. It'll take care of itself. Be about the things of God, and that'll go with the flow of it just fine, and all that'll be taken care of. Look at the birds. They just do what God designed them to do, and look, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns, but your heavenly Father feeds them. You're worth more than the birds, and He's going to take care of food and clothing for you as well. So that's, that's one illustration that's there. And then um, verse 27 I'm not going to go into that, it's going to take too long. But verse 27, here's the translation I'm reading from. And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? How many of you have something really different from that? What do you, what, what do you have? One cubit to his stature is very different from adding a single hour to his life. At least in English, that's very different. Now, I'm not going to go into all of that because it gets really cumbersome, but I will point you a direction. Truth for Today Commentary does a really good job laying out why that difference is there, and it's really not that different. There is... A, a, wording there that can, like cubit, can sometimes be used to talk about a portion of time. And they actually supply a passage where that occurs. And uh, stature can sometimes refer to lifespan. Well, the Truth For Today commentary will, will do a really good job laying that out and help you understand all that and you can follow it along and check the passages and See how that's so, and it'll clear up the problem that's there. And you say, well, I don't have truth for today commentary. Well, that's wrote, that, that is written by brethren. And, uh, and it's a really good commentary set. And there's a copy down in our library, the other end of the building. So you can go down there, spend a few minutes in the library, and look at that reference work, and there's a copy down there you can look at. And then, let me mention this. Eddie Clower is coming Sunday night. He's the editor of that work. He's the one in charge of getting those books out. And so when Eddie comes here Sunday night, and he may say, are there any questions? And you can raise your hand and say, yeah, what about that cubit stature thing? And throw him a curveball. But uh, I would encourage you to study some more about that. But the, the translation difference is built around this idea that sometimes the words can mean this or they can mean that. The point is pretty plain. I can worry and worry and worry that I'm not six foot two. You probably didn't recognize I'm not six foot two. But I'm not. And I can worry about that day and night and I won't grow an inch. It doesn't accomplish anything. It's pointless. And that's the idea in verse 27. You're spinning your wheels over something you really can't do anything about and it won't accomplish anything, it's not productive. The second illustration is about flowers. <clears throat> that's in verses 28 through 30. Why are you worried about clothing? Observe the lilies of the field, uh, how they grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. <clears throat> they don't make any clothing for themselves. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, 
Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So, two illustrations. One about wildflowers, one about birds. <clears throat> they just fulfill their design in God's plan. And God takes care of the rest. Will we as Christian people trust God that way? Be about his business. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then he promises all these things are going to be taken care of. One of the big differences that we have is this. When you talk about birds and food, and you talk about lilies of the field and clothing, what is food and clothing? What is that? What is it? Necessities. What do we tend to worry about? Luxuries. The bigger house, the newer car, the bigger vacation, the name brand clothing, we worry about the luxuries. And while we worry about the luxuries and we want to have our budgets bulging as much as they can, the kingdom suffers while we work it off and consume ourselves, our time and our energy in all of that and maybe don't have time for prayer or study or evangelism or even for assembling with the saints. And sometimes... In our homes, we even train our children to be better equipped to gain the material things of the world than we do the salvation of their souls. And so we are encouraged about having the right focus and choosing the right master. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8, But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we've brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. We can end up, if we're not careful, living very much like the unconverted in verse 32. For the Gentiles eagerly seek after all these things. Your Heavenly Father knows that you need these things. And He's promised to take care of us in that way. Anything else you want to mention before we close that chapter? All right, we are ready to move on then to chapter 7. I do have a new handout for you. If I could get a couple of men to come up and help me hand these out. We'll get them through the auditorium very quickly. Thank you. And thank you. This opens up chapter 7, and it is the last chapter in the section we call the Sermon on the Mount. And this handout is going to carry us through that material. So while they're handing that out, let's remind ourselves of, a, ourselves of a few things. This one is titled Logs and Specks, and goes from chapter 7, verse 1 through verse 29. That will be the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5.20 is still ruling our thought process. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now what I'd like you to do is think about how Matthew 5.20, our righteousness needs to exceed their kind of righteousness. Chapter 6 opened up with, how we practice righteousness in giving, in prayers, in fasting. We need to exceed their style of righteousness. Now we come to chapter 7, and chapter 7 is going to open up with a very familiar line. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. What I'd like you to do is to begin thinking this way. How does this prevailing thought of Matthew 5.20 Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you're not going to enter the kingdom. 
How does that connect to do not judge so that you will not be judged? How does that connect? And right now that's a mystery, isn't it? Right now you think about that and you go, I don't know. How would that connect? Well, it does connect. This is something that just goes along with the text from chapter 5, chapter 6 into chapter 7. We're being presented with something that makes sense with the rest of it. Chapter 6 closed with, hey, verse 24, be sure you choose the right master, therefore having the right priority of life. Now we're being told there's something else about the scribes and Pharisees. There's something else about it. It's their standard of judgment. Think about how they judged. Think about in their way of thinking, who wasn't good enough for the kingdom of heaven? Who wouldn't you give that consideration to? Who wasn't worth stopping and talking to? Who shouldn't be forgiven? Judge not so that you won't be judged. He's talking about the scribes and the Pharisees. He's talking about this faulty standard that they have. So Matthew 5.20 is going to connect here. We have thoughts in chapter 7 that are going to have connecting points with them just like that. You start out in the first six verses with this idea of judging. But it's the wrong kind of judging. And then in verses 7 through 12, what's that text about? You're familiar with it. I know you are. What are some key words in verses 7 through 12? What do you recognize there? Ask, seek, knock. Okay, we start out with this idea of judging. Then ask, seek, knock. What about verses 13 through 27? There's three illustrations you're going to find there. What's the first one? There's two, there's two ways. There's two gates, a wide and a narrow one. What comes after that? Two what? Two kinds of trees, two kinds of fruit. And then the third illustration, what's that about? What is it? The houses, the foundations, the wise man, the foolish man. So you have these three illustrations, judging, ask, seek, knock, three illustrations, two gates, two trees, two kinds of foundations, and then it closes with the reaction from the crowd that was listening in verses 28 and 29. All of that is going to fit together. All of that has connecting points with it, and that's our task is to connect all of that together in a way that makes sense. In the middle of all of that, there's some really familiar statements, but what do they have to do with everything else around them? For example, verse 6, you don't throw your pearls before the swine. Remember hearing that? This is where it's at. What's that got to do with all of that? What about verse 12? What do we call verse 12? What's the common name for that? The golden rule. You treat other people the way you want them to treat you. There's that verse. Well, what does all of that have to do with everything else? How does it all fit together? This is like a puzzle. Every time we come to a chapter in the Bible, the book of the Bible, you're going to find this kind of puzzle. How does it all fit together? Rather than grab just a couple verses here and, and highlight those outside of everything else around it, how does it all fit together? This is like putting a puzzle together. Aren't you excited when you dump a thousand pieces out on your table and you get them all turned right side up? And after you get that basic framework done, that basic outside board, you get that done, aren't you excited when you find a piece and it fits? That's what Bible study is like. When you come to a passage and you have all these parts, all these component parts, and we know them all. We've talked about them. They've been in lessons and sermons, and we've run across them. But as these individual pieces, and now it's a puzzle, and we have to fit it all together. 
And, and isn't it exciting to see when one piece fits another and all of a sudden the picture begins to develop? I absolutely love that, and that's what we're setting out to do here. So verses 1 through 6. Let me take a quick peek. Where are we getting with time? Oh, we're doing good. All right. Verses 1 through 6. Let's just read it. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they'll trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. So the first question is about, about judgment. Is judgment, or we might use the word discernment, is all judgment wrong? Is it? Okay, you know the answer to that's no. You know that. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, you know that. You, look, you do it when you hire somebody to cut your grass. They get done, and you want to go out and see what kind of job they did. You're judging. We do it all the time. You, you know, they, they, you go to buy something at the store or the drive through and they send you, you give the receipt, and they circle it and say, if you take this little survey within three days, you might get this. And you fill out that survey, you know what you're doing? You're judging. We do that all the time. But look just here in this context in Matthew 7, verses 15 and 16. Beware of who? Beware of who? False prophets, False prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? Every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. You are judging the product of the false prophets. You are judging to see if they're telling the truth or telling a lie, if they're, if they're sincere and honest and genuine, or if they're something else. So here is a, a practice of judging discernment in the, in the same chapter that starts out, don't judge. So it's not that kind of judgment that's wrong. It's a different kind of judgment that's wrong. You can look at a lot of passages like that. They're all over the place. In 1 Corinthians 5, verse 9, we are not to keep company with immoral people. And then he goes on to explain, I'm not, I'm not just talking about people out in the world, I'm talking about your brethren, those who are your brothers and sisters in Christ, and they go on practicing immorality, don't keep company with them, don't even eat with such a one. You know what you're doing? You're judging. And there's, there's other passages we could look at about being une unequally yoked together with unbelievers. We have to do some judging to be able to practice that text. How could we in Galatians 6, 1 and 2, how could we look at someone and go to restore the erring without practicing some discernment, some judgment, to know that they've erred from the faith? You can't even fulfill some New Testament commands without judging some things. So not all judgment is wrong. We are required to do some judging. So there's something about this kind of judgment that's wrong. And it goes back to Matthew 5 and verse 20. Exceeding the style of righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, they would look, for example, remember the, uh, in, in uh, Luke 18, verses 10 through 12, there's the Pharisee and the publican. King James used the word publican, tax collector. And they both come to the temple to pray. 
and the Pharisee gazes up toward heaven. He's real proud of himself, and he looks over at that tax collector, and he says, well, at least I'm not like him. And he starts crowing about all the good things that he does that makes him worthy to stand before God. He's, and the text actually said he prayed to himself. While the tax collector just doesn't even have the courage to draw near and humbles himself before God, be merciful to me. <clears throat> Their judgment standard was out of whack with God. They would do things like that and look down their nose at other people. Look at, uh, at Luke 5. Luke chapter 5, I think it's verse 20. No, that can't be it. Luke 5, verse 30. The Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Judge not lest you be judged. That kind of judgment. The kind of judgment you measure out will be returned to you again. That's going to come back at you. It's that kind of judgment where some people were not worth the effort. They were throwaway people. They were not worthy of the mercy and grace of God. It's that kind of judgment that's being condemned in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5 or 6, around in there. Uh, it's interesting that our culture has gone to an extreme with that, where they condemn all judgment and demand that you tolerate everybody, their wishes, their desires, their practices, you tolerate, no, you don't just tolerate it, you condone it. You put a stamp of approval, it's okay, say it's okay. All judgment and condemnation is wrong. That's not the point of Matthew 7, verses 1 through 6. That is not what Jesus is saying. We have to do some judging, some discernment about some things. And it's interesting to me that I've had discussions with people in the world. And do you know that they have Matthew 7, 1 memorized? If you bring up anything about, about it, that they're doing something wrong and you don't approve of it, oh, well, Matthew 7, 1 says not to judge. Don't you believe the Bible? You shouldn't be judging me. And they use it out of its context. Interesting how they know that. You can have husbands who don't know anything about the Bible except Ephesians 5. Woman, you're supposed to submit to me. They know that one. And the world knows, judge not lest you be judged. But they don't know the context and they don't know the meaning. The next section is hyperbole. The next section is humorous hyperbole. A man has a log in his eye, and he's trying to get the speck out of somebody else's eye. This is part of this false, false uh, standard of righteousness that the scribes and Pharisees have. It'd be like, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm behind a telephone pole, and I'm trying to tie your tie. It just it doesn't work well. You can't do that. So they, they have this massive thing in their eye. And by the way, when Jesus talked to the scribes and Pharisees, they had, no, that wasn't five minutes either. They had, they had no, no idea that they were sinners. They had no idea they needed anything Jesus had to offer. We've never been enslaved to anybody. What do you mean set free? We've never been... That was their perspective of themselves. They had a log in their eye, and they didn't realize it, and they're picking at the tax collectors and sinners and, and, and people in their culture, and that's the speck. 
And so they have that kind of a perspective of things. Now we'll come back in our next class and we'll examine this humorous hyperbole of the log in the eye and the speck in the neighbor's eye and what all that's about and what's the cure for the log in the eye and how does it change the perspective of dealing with a speck in somebody else's eye. What happens to that scenario? If, if I find the cure for my log, what does that do to how I handle the speck? That's what we want to begin looking at in our next class. So keep your paperwork, bring it back with you. Thanks for being here. We are dismissed.